Hi everybody, I'm John Atak and I am, as always, delighted to welcome Karen de la Carriere. Hi Karen. John. Right, well, um, we're going to talk about, I, I sort of sent you my list of the characteristics of a human predator and um, I'm surprised really that no ex-scientologist has come to me and said, but isn't this the suppressive person you're talking about? And uh, of course, Hubbard, with his anti-scientologist, his anti-social personality, was relying very heavily on a book called The Mask of Sanity by Hervey Cleckley mm -hmm. and written in the 1940s. And you can see that Hubbard takes some of his points from there. Cleckley is the beginning of the modern study of psychopaths. And since then, you know, uh, Robert Hare has become the, the go-to guy, though there are quite a lot of people doing work on this. And I looked at this and some of Hubbard's points are fairly preposterous. Um, others of them are, are reasonably true. I had, after I'd written, let's sell these people a piece of blue sky, I had a letter from Richard DeMille. Richard DeMille was the adopted son of Cecil B. DeMille, the famous film director. He was his nephew by blood, so he was related. And he wrote uh, Science of Survival and How to Live Own Executive um, as Hubbard's um, sort of amanuensis um, from, you know, Hubbard's ideas, but he wrote the books. And he, he finally fell out with Hubbard as almost everybody did and went off and became a professor of psychology. Oh. And um, he was involved in exposing Carlos Castaneda, who was a dreadful person, <laughs> really, oh, really, yes. And he made up the teachings of Don Juan. It, there was nothing behind it. He did not go and do any studies of any kind. But DeMille was involved with that. But he wrote me a letter out of the blue. He'd, he'd read Blue Sky and he said, this is the best book about Scientology, which is very pleasing. And he said, and I've read them all. And by that time, by my reckoning, there were 14 books before mine. Um, and he said, and, and the thing I most like is that you identify Ron Hubbard as the suppressive person. So we looked at some of the characteristics and... Um, you know, they're, they're in my book, Opening Our Minds. Um, and so we wanted to talk a little bit about some of the more outrageous behaviour that Hubbard exhibited. And I think you wanted to start with an anecdote about Julia Salmon, who for many work, work. And even just before I tell the little anecdote on Julia Salmon, I want to tell you that Hubbard did have extraordinary temper tantrums, mm. just explosive. Apparently, yeah. that's one of your characteristics. Is. Before volcanic explosions, you could hear the roar. <laughs> we used to, we used to say the ship was traveling. Mm. My auditing room was exactly behind his research room, so there was just wall of partition, my auditing room was back to back with Hubbard's research room. Yeah. And Hubbard had, you see, you see, John, it never even occurred to me to say, how could he be the founder of a new religious movement, the big enlightened guru and have uncontrollable rage? And claim to be a Buddha, you know, a, yeah, a Buddha yeah. with a vicious temper. That doesn't sound quite right, does it? Yeah. These were furies of monumental proportions when he went into these rages. These were monstrous rages. Mm. And you see, when, you, when you're in the tunnel, in the bubble, you don't, it never occurred to me to say, wait a moment, this, how can this be? But, but the, this was an indicator, mm. right? This was an indicator, all was not right. But, yep. And you know, the funny thing is my declare, my SP declare, got to send it to you. It's a kind of a boring 
just boring. There's nothing juicy in it. Nothing. Well, mine was boring <laughs> too. Very sad. <laughs> but one of the main things that dominated the declare is I have a temper and I yell. And this is interrelated to tech and fall. Mm. And I read this and I thought, you know, you fool. You should have been on the Apollo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you think I have temper tantrums? You have no idea what L. Ron Hubbard's explosive, monstrous rages were. I might have been 5% of Hubbard's dramatizing rages. Mm -hmm. For Ness, we declare. <laughs> Julia Salomon was a devotee, no other word to give her. She shadowed L. Ron Hubbard. He went to Phoenix to give like she was in his entourage. She went everywhere. And she was probably his earliest, what we would call communicator. Hmm. Your communicator is your personal assistant. Yeah. She was your Spike Robinson. She just looked after him mm. and all in the early volumes several tech issues were written signed julia salmon mm. of course the cultures would quickly edited all that and got l ron hubbard's signature on issues all the issue is tossed out mm. as not, not happening julia went in 1968 to do the first class eight course. And this is the course where you, you'd learn to audit people who are doing the, the highest level of Scientology operating Thetan level three, where you were going to acquire supernatural powers. So the class eight course was being taught by Hubbard on the ship, the Apollo, in the Mediterranean in 1968. Yes. It was considered the cat's meow, the mm. class eight course. There was nothing higher. Mm. This was the absolute peak of training. And Hubbard himself gave two hour lectures every day for 12 days. And I, I, somebody sent me the transcripts. And when I looked at them with the eyes I now have, mm. I shook my head in disbelief. There's one called ethics and penalties or something like that. Mm. And you see Hubbard's revenge personality. He's going to punish and humiliate you. Isn't humiliation one of the traits that Absolutely. you- Absolutely, that, that uh, human predators like to humiliate other people. It gives them pleasure. And obviously pro-social people don't like doing that. Pretty simple, really. Julie Julia Salmon was about 62, 63 years old, and she made what we call a counseling mistake or error, minor mm -hmm. error. And she was in line to be thrown overboard. It, people can't believe this, but Hubbard, because of his power, and his word was law, the law, mm -hmm. had the power to take someone on the ship and have them hurled and thrown overboard into the ocean. It was about four stories down from promenade deck into the ocean. So you, didn't... if you think about the high diving board at a swimming pool, that's about 15 feet high. So we're talking about 25, 30, even depending where you're thrown from, maybe even 40 feet. So it's much, you know, and I've never, I've never come from the high diving board. This idea of being hurled this distance it, it is really very scary. And, and before we go any further, Auditor number 41, a publication of Scientology, has a, a center page spread where you see somebody being thrown overboard and the credit reads photos by L. Ron Hubbard. So for anybody who thinks he didn't know about it, not only knew about it, he boasted about it. And boasting is another characteristic of the human predator. Uh, so this 63-year-old woman, she didn't know how to swim. And she was petrified. She was just frozen. And her turn came, and she was hurled over. Um, she was hurled into the ocean. Uh, 
Hubbard found out in the early, every day there were overboards, every day, every day, every day. It fascinated the locals. The locals would come and watch this. This is off uh, Corfu, yes, off the Greek island of Corfu in the Mediterranean Sea. Correct. And, uh, or is it in the Aegean Sea? I can't, I'm not very good at geography. It's one of the two, but yeah. So Julia, she was drowning and two people jumped in, towed and rescued her heavy body and her life. <laughs> I mean, a punishment was order that could have killed her. Yeah. So the next day, Julia Salman packed up her goods, walked off the Apollo, walked out of Scientology, never to be heard of again. That jolted her so much, she saw the darker side of Hubbard. She saw that 20 years of devotion meant nothing, absolutely meant nothing. If Hubbard turned on you, he would use all his forces to punish and humiliate you. Did you want to say something, John? Yeah, it, a couple of things. Firstly, there, there is an account of the overboardings uh, written by the British consul to call for uh, John Fort, um, called the Commodore and the Colonels. The Colonels, of course, being the military junta or junta that were running Greece at the time. It was a dictatorship, military dictatorship, and that's the kind of place that, that Hubbard liked. The other thing is that I've interviewed a lot of people over the years who were very close to Hubbard and then suddenly realized what they were doing and, and you reminded me of John Sanborn mm -hmm. John took over all publications from 1954 to 1978 so every issue that came out every book that came out was edited by John Sanborn perhaps most famously Hymn of Asia mm -hmm. um, where Hubbard claims to be Metea or Maitreya the Buddha who will lead all of humanity to enlightenment within his lifetime. That's, it's from a Buddhist text called the Book of the Great Decease, which of course along the way I have read. And he said that Hubbard presented this to him in 1954 and said, publish this. And he mm -hmm. cringed because the first line was, I am Maitreya. Mm -hmm. And years later in about 1974, 20 years later, John realized that he could turn it into, am I? And that would seem a little less, here we are, boastful again, a little less um, braggadocio. But John said that, I interviewed him in Los Angeles uh, back in the 80s, and he said that the day came in 1978 when he was yet again asked to transfer a huge amount of money from Scientology into Ron Hubbard's personal bank account bearing in mind that, that Hubbard left $648 million when he died, all of it taken from Scientology, he made no money from the publication of Mission Earth or Battlefield Earth, they lost money. So all of this money had come. And John said to me, he said, I realized I'd for you know, 24 years, I've been living on $5 a week while this man was getting fat. And from then on, I decided I would never say another kind word about him and I call him Tubby, and that's all there is to it. So it's a very, very sweet man. But I say I met so many people over the years who had suddenly had that what Hubbard would call a cognition, the revelation that the man they were dealing with was not a Buddha. He was not the salvation of mankind. He was a selfish, mean, sadistic human being. And so much of it is that if you find yourself in a group and the group are all doing something, then you tend to go along with it. And if you want to believe that this is your salvation, then anything that challenges it, you will fight against. And so Scientologists became willing to do horrendous things to people who are considered opponents. Uh, when I first talked with Mike Rinder, uh, well, it's the second time I talked with him. The first time was when he came to harass me with a bunch of people from Los Angeles. And he said quite casually to me, and I really like Mike, I think he's a great guy. But he said to me in this conversation, which is on the channel here, that even though I seemed like a nice person, he would quite happily have destroyed me 
because he'd been told that I was opposed to Scientology. So everything goes out of the window. People become willing to, um, you know, people who believe absurdities will commit atrocities, as Voltaire said. And that's the situation that we all, to some degree, found ourselves in. That we were desperate to believe that that we were, you know, going to achieve this wonderful, beautiful world, as long as we followed this mad, vicious human being. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well spoken. I I. J Julia's story was in 1968. Mm. That's when people were thrown overboard. Yes. Um, but the tradition continued. Hubbard set the example, and Miscavige throws people into lakes, into swimming pools. There's this. There's there was a lake. There is a lake at Ink Base which was infested with dead birds. This is in Gilman Hot Springs in California. Gilman Hot Springs, yeah. And for the slightest, th th this was showing dominance and power. People were hurled into the lake. It was, it was truly a lake with deposits of feces because they have some er er aeration system and it dumped off stuff into this lake. So the humiliation, well, first of all, hurling staff members that work for you seven day hours a week with almost no pay, no day off, no, no annual leave, and to punish them by hurling them into a lake of bacteria is, is pretty horrific. And so many people got ill that half the staff were not even on post, that they then shifted it to hurling them into the swimming pool that's on this fake ship. The star the of California. Area. Yeah. And like, for example, women, what the law is whatever David Miscavige fancies in that unit of time, whatever he, one day at two in the morning, everyone was forced to go to the ship, everyone. And then one by one, they had to walk the plank with full clothes on and drop into the pool. Well, the, the point of walking the plank in Scientology, you have the so called ethics conditions. There's things that basically measure statistically how successful you are. And the top one, if you have an almost vertical line, you know, of money coming in or what have you, is called power. And the bottom one used to be called in 1968 shark bait, mm. which meant oh. overboarding. Oh. Oh, shark bait. Shark bait. <laughs> and and, and just, it makes me, the whole overboarding thing and, and hosing people down and all of these things, it makes me think about Caligula, the Roman emperor or, or Nero, yeah. relative. But these people who are given absolute power and will power. then use it to the full to see, you know, what they can get away with. And Caligula famously, um, somebody, I think they said to him that after he'd recovered from an illness, they wished it had been them who'd been ill instead of him. So he had them tied up in a bag and thrown in the River Tiber to see if they really did mean that. <laughs> so these mean temperamental people who, who are preying upon the people around them, who, and that's always the thing, isn't it? When, what, for about eight years, people were put into the double trailer called The Hole by David Miscavige, including your former husband, Heber Gensch. And what is difficult to understand is why there was no mutiny, why there was no rebellion, why people this just, and that has so often been the case in history, hasn't it, where a tyrant comes along, they do awful things, and you sort of, why are people going along with this? Why is, how has this herd mentality, this group think, been, obedience been developed? And Scientology is a fascinating study in those terms. And it's... You know, I was a believer for nine years, so I'm not in a position to criticize anybody. I believe this absolute nonsense that is Scientology. There's something strange that happens. It's not just swallowing the ideology. It becomes a crusade. 
Yeah, salvation. Clear the you to show your love for the group and Hubbard, and it becomes, you know, you can have an ideology that you can believe in, but this is beyond ideology. This becomes your, anyway, you get the point. So it becomes your raison d'etre, it becomes your reason for being. Right, perfect. Um, bingo, right on the nose. So, um, <laughs> So Julia departing, a devotee of 20 years, walking out the door, Hubbard didn't learn any lesson. Let's fast wind to 10 years into the 10 years forward. Mm. I'll tell you a quick little anecdote. You know, people wonder, John, how come Scientology can bubble up to the ranks of governments of the world being opposed to how how can that even happen? A small little cult of 20, 30,000 members with huge amounts of reports constantly and horror stories. How could it rise to government level? Hmm. So it's like Bill Clinton and George W. Bush are both making supportive statements. The Obama administration criticized the German government for saying we don't want Scientologists in the civil service. And the reason we don't want them is because they're spying for Scientology, which had been proved in court cases in the US and Canada. People went to prison for it. And yet, Barack Obama, you know, Republicans and Democrats alike, Clinton used to say, well, well I was at Oxford with, with a Scientologist, Richard Reese, in fact, finally worked that one out. Um, and he seemed all right. And therefore, we're going to protect them. Uh, Willie B. Wilson, the oil billionaire, was a friend of the Bush family. So they said, well, we've got this friend who's in it. They were also friends with the Bin Laden family, of course. So, you know, you can't be totally sure about about any of that but yes how how can this tiny group be so influential uh, you know, how is it that somebody like Richard Dawkins the uh, militant atheist he said in print that Scientology is a major religion I'm not really sure what he means by major I'm not really sure what he means by religion frankly in the case of Scientology either but it is, it, it really does beg the question, doesn't it? Well, uh, just to finish that part, yeah. it rises up to government level because of this kind of conduct, mm. this kind of conduct. I was going to explain Howard's personality from your bullet points there yeah. and show you, give you little anecdotes which tell you how the, this kind of conduct ripping people's money right off till the bone and they're destitute and can't even pay the, the and Scientology has siphoned off all the money from it. This kind of thing, eventually people have nowhere to turn. So they go to their councilman and they go to their senator and they go to their congressman and it bubbles up and it lands in authorities it lands in legal authorities it lands in tons of people reporting to the department of justice to reporting daily to the irs it's their own conduct that eventually makes look the apollo was kicked out of every port we ever went to mm -hmm. kicked out of ports yes the right. whole point of a port is to get money, the harbor master, every single day, the, a ship is birthed at a port. In those days, it was like $10,000 a day back in the set. God knows what the, you don't birth in a land for free. You have to pay. Of course, you get water and supplies, you get replenishments, you get gas and oil for the ship. But to do all the hookups, just to sit in port costs money. Harbors want that money. Mm -hmm. Consider cruise ships and rich ships, uh, wealthy Westerners, give us poor islanders your money. But they didn't even want that money. Scientology was so hated and such a leper to be expelled that even these banana islands didn't want Scientology in the Mediterranean. Port after port kicked them out, even though. It was good money to just have that ship birthed at their port. So you can imagine Scientology is hated by the general public. 
every story that comes out, every, yes, George Bush could quack and another president could quack and the German Obama, but the general population have gotten completely wise. And, and dark it's everywhere now. We, we, there was a period uh, when the original edition of Peace of Blue Sky, Let's Sell These People a Peace of Blue Sky, came out in 1990. It was the last book for 20 years in the English language because they sued Time magazine. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm told spent $20 million on that suit and lost it. And then the floodgates opened and Rolling Stone published Janet Reitman's article. And now it just about every TV show or many of the TV shows say like the Kaminsky method with, with Michael Douglas and Alan Arkin, which was Arkin was brilliant in it. But Arkin's grandson is a Scientologist in it. And episode after episode, he's trying to get money. And they, it's you know, South Park, of course, the, the wonderful come out of the closet episode. It's now ridiculed, generally. Mm -hmm. And this other side of it, yes, on the one side, there's the influence that they've managed to, to have American presidents and various other politicians. But the other side is the story that Steve Kinane, uh, who is a wonderful man, great. Oh, he's fabulous. Uh, and, and really a, just a, an ethical, fine human being in my dealings with him over the last 10 years now. Um, mm -hmm. But he, his book, Fair Game, he traced the history of Scientology in Australia. And what you find is it was just one man who had, he, he had influence because he'd been involved with the Labour Party in Australia. And he, was, uh, he published um, magazines mm -hmm. and promoting his political friends. And then he got involved with Scientology. And he said that one day, he was sat giving somebody an auditing session and asking about their goals, because back in the early 60s, you'd ask at the beginning of the session, what are your goals? What do you want to achieve? And the guy said that he wanted to earn more money. And this guy went, oh, yeah, before I got into Scientology, I was earning a really good wage. Now I'm earning next to nothing. And he asked for his money back. And I think it was 3000 Australian dollars, which would be a 2000 American dollars, something like that. And he, they wouldn't give it back. So he wrote to Hubbard and Hubbard told him, I'm not going to give you the money back. And that was how the Anderson inquiry started. Wow. One man was not given, you know, we, we always deliver what we promise, Elrin Hubbard says, they hadn't. And the policy was that if somebody complains, you give them their money back. They didn't. He had a lot of political contacts. And that went from the state of Victoria to two other Australian states, to the Ontario report in Canada, the South African report, the Rhodesian report, and the UK government report, uh, which is the Foster report, which is very interesting reading because Foster, just John Foster, who was a member of parliament, Queen's Council, the highest rank of lawyer in, in the UK, in England. And he writes this incredible document, which is almost all quotations from Hubbard, from policy letters which are, when you put them all together and you look at it, you go, he was a really unpleasant human being. He really hated people and he really wanted revenge. He really wanted to get his own back on people. He did. So yeah, you've got this strange situation where the IRS who did the Internal Revenue Service in the US, the tax authorities there did so well and, and uh, their 1977 ruling is so accurate. It's so beautifully put together. And then somehow they roll over. So you've got this, there's a public disdain for Scientology, but they still are able to um, create fear at, at high levels of government. And I, I think really it's just, it's, it's the kind of, you know, that he who shouts loudest gets served first. Mm. So when something looks threatening, and makes it difficult. I, I met with an IRS guy, and it's the only contact I ever had with the IRS. I'm, I'm not part of a CIA conspiracy, honest. I've never met anybody from CIA. But I was in um, Reno, Nevada, and uh, there was a guy there called Bill Jordan who'd had his company 
green raided, ripped off by a couple of Scientologists. And so he got me over there and he got me in the room with an IRS guy who was very, very cagey until he, and I had a book out, they should have known who I was by then. And eventually he realized that I really was who I said I was. And he said, Scientology is the biggest case in the history of the internal revenues. It is the first case to have had more than 1,000 agents working on it. And this was about two years before they rolled over and just went, all right, we don't care, leave us alone. And we still don't know why. But one imagines there may have been a certain amount of blackmail involved. Who knows? Well, I have a private investigator friend who has a long-term lifetime friendship with a senior IRS agent. Mm. And he leaked to my private investigator friend that the younger generation, all those old, you know, the 1991, the, the, the yep. tax, the new generation, but the new generation absolutely hate Scientology. The new generation of CPAs and lawyers saw and heard, and it, 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 let me do a comparison. Palestine and Israel, younger Palestinians are fostered a kind of them versus us. They never even experienced Israel, but their parents and grandparents have told them Israel, or is, likewise, Israel to Palestine. So well, when, when, you, when you search everywhere you go in Israel because you're an Arab, it, it can make it a little bit upsetting. But what I'm trying yeah. to say is it can travel through generations. Yeah, it's yeah. a generational. And IRS has the same thing. Mm -hmm. The current IRS hate Scientology. I know this may sound like a generality, but all the... Uh, they tried to sue 1,400 agents personally. All these things the vengeance of Scientology, the crowing at that event, we won the war, the war is over. War is over. Crowing and showing IRS agent. All of this is embedded in current IRS agents that spit on the despicable nature of Scientology. They spit on it. So they have, they may have rolled over, but they have no friends in the IRS. The IRS know exactly if it quacks like a duck, walks like a duck, it is a duck. They know the duck quality, mm. the abominable quality of Scientology. This this was a very, <laughs> I don't even know if I'm supposed to say any of this, but this is a leak straight from the heart of the IRS mm. on, on the attitude towards this despicable cult. Anyway. Yeah. So we're going to scroll. That was very good, John. Your inputs today, your inputs have been just totally classic John Atac. Okay. <laughs> you know your facts, you know your... So we're going to scroll forward from hurling Julia Solomon into the ocean when she couldn't swim. We're hurling it forward to 10 years now to 1978. Mm -hmm. Janice Grady is a close personal friend of mine. We grew up on the Apollo together. She actually recruited me into the Sea Org. Wow. She didn't recruit me. She ran down with a message from the Commodore Hubbard, who had heard that I was a class eight and I was on the ship for services. Mm -hmm. And Janice said, she used the word Commodore, Elwin Hubbard said, have you signed your CEO contract yet? Which was a personal invite from Hubbard. Mm -hmm. And boy, I, I did. Yep. I dazzled and the boss is inviting me. She was the messenger. She often tells the story of how she, <laughs> anyway. Well, for, for you know, people who don't, don't know, Janice was Janice Gillum. Um, Janice, he's, Yvonne Jensch's daughter. Mm -hmm. Yvonne Gillum, Yvonne Jensch's and, and she and her sister and brother were the first members of what became the Commodore's Messenger Organization. Right. She was 11 years old and she was with Hubbard pretty much every day for the next 11 years. And she's written extensively about her experience of Hubbard. 
yeah, she was not only with Howard, she was with Howard like eight hours a day. Yeah. So she's written book one, book two, and book three is forthcoming. She's mm -hmm. working on now. Um, Janice did something which was just a stupid little. In those days, in 1978, Howard had the identity of photographer. And he would go out on photo shoots. Some of these pictures, <laughs> there's nothing in a, a master photographer album that, anyway, people were putting on gawky costumes. The, the one I particularly, he, huh? there were covers of Advance magazine. And yeah. What I particularly remember was the issue on the Aztecs, where yeah. you have oh, no. some of the altar. And one of the, um, the, the women who was there at the time when she testified at the Clearwater hearing said that the thing she really couldn't get was how much gore he wanted. He wanted blood over everything, you know, that's what he really liked, which fits in. And of course, they were using corn syrup with stuff mixed into it. To, so it would have been absolutely horrible in the heat doing that. But but yes, these are not these are not uh, Ansel Adams, you know, they're not uh, a great photographer's work by any means. Before I even get into Janice's story, I got to tell you just very quickly, Terry is her sister, a dearest friend as well. And oh. Terry was with her. They would all go out with Hubbard. They were trained to care, hold an ashtray for him, care for his every need, have fresh water. Oh, a cigarette because he had to always have a cigarette so that he could smoke a hundred a day. Cool, cool cigarette, you know, every... And, you know, they're unfiltered cools, and later on they went to pecoons, which were made in New Orleans, because cools weren't strong enough anymore. Mm. And this is the man who founded the drug rehab agency, Narconon, and who was an addict up until about two years before he died. He was also an alcoholic by the time he died. He also said that not smoking will give you cancer. We got to, mm. we got to, I got to send spikes. We smoke because we're frightened of volcanoes. There you go. Oh, it's a volcano. I better have a cigarette. <laughs> okay. So, but he uh, couldn't stop. He asked Terry on one of Terry's, Janice's older sister, to hose down something. Um, this is all part of getting the preps and set up for a photo shoot. Mm -hmm. And Terry picked up some nozzle and sprayed. Now, here's the humiliation. Hubbard said to the group, you see what she did? You see that hose? She's Marca. It's a Marcabian. The Marcabians were an earlier sci-fi civilization that <laughs> were- By Captain Bill Roberts. <laughs> and they were pretty, pretty deadly. Mm. So <laughs> here's the messenger at his side who has been since 13 years old, whatever. And he's humiliating her by telling the rest of the group, she chose that nozzle. See, that that's a mock-up. She's... It's she's like a, calling somebody a Nazi. It's, a, it's an insult. Right, yeah. exactly. Anyway, back to Janice. Janice, in, in a kind of mix-up, her purse and the keys to her car, she looked at Hubbard's RV and she put it inside there for safety because when you're on location and you're moving and just for safety's sake, she put her car keys and her wallet or purse in Hubbard's RV. Then they went off in the day and they did it. And when she came back, the RV was gone, so she had no car keys. One of the drivers looking after Hubbard had, for advance actions, had the RV had already gone back to the base, whatever. So Janet had no car keys. And this caused, so she couldn't arrive on duty to report to serve Hubbard. It was just a, a mix up of leaving your keys in a location where you have no access to your car. And for this, Oh boy, Janice went through torture. 
a security guard came to her and tried to tell her she was, and she shrunk, she was a senior, man. she was, a, she only reported to Hubbard. She was way up there in the structure. And he said, he called out, get six of the biggest guys with the most body weight and height and get them here right away. And six guys arrived and Janice was hurled. This wasn't in base. This was the little cottages they had in La Quinta. Yeah. And she was siphoned into a room and locked in from the outside. And she was told she had to go to the RPF and she- The rehabilitation project force, the labor force, the gulag. Was, the prison camps, the prison camps of Scientology to reprogram your mind to be obedient. John, could you just read out a couple of paragraphs of what the RPF is I sent you in, in the bullet points? Um, the RPF has been created by the Commodore um, so that redemption can occur. Roughly speaking, the person not only has fallen from rank, but also from his civil rights, social rights, and even family rights. The rpf -er, as he or she is called, is not allowed to live with his or her spouse and children, is not to have a sexual relationship, even with a husband or wife. He or she can't use a car or a bicycle, can't talk to people unless being spoken to. The rpf -er is some sort of subclass man deprived of freedom of speech. This person only receives a third of his pay, which is already quite meager, and finds him or herself with four or five dollars a week if no other disciplinary sanction has been taken against him or her. The person must take meals segregated from the rest of the group, provided that the meals are made of leftovers from others' meals. And that, given that, that the rest of the crew might be on rice and beans, leftovers were pretty bad. In the Clearwater hearings, there was a guy who um, testified that he found a palmetto bug in his food and mm -hmm. that such a thing was not unusual, cockroaches and things like that. Um, da, 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 segregated from the rest of the group. Uh, the person must sleep in the worst accommodations. Indeed, at Clearwater for a while, they were not allowed mattresses. I was told that was because Donna Haber had accidentally set fire to her mattress or something, but um, and it was Harvey, her husband, who told me that. So hopefully a reliable source. Um, I must put on black and and dirty clothes, so they wear black. A distinctive uh, mark. Uh, the person is to wear a black ribbon to signify he or she is ostracised, and you can see that in Charlie Nairn's Shrinking World of Alron Hubbard. When you look at the sea organization, the elite force of planet Earth in that film taken in 1968, uh, around the time of overboarding, you see these poor, terrified people with, with rags tied round their arms, um, and which, it, which is the, that's the sea org at that time. But uh, so RPFers, uh, and they have to run from one job to another. If they refuse an order, they have to run a lap and if they refuse the lap, they're given two, and it, the punishment is doubled and doubled. Um, they do menial tasks, cleaning toilets, for example. That's their job. Um, and they're ba basically humiliated and abased until such time as they become fully compliant. And I and you too have probably met a number of people over the years who were broken by the RPF. They were tamed. They were reduced to simply following orders and doing as they were told. In an organization that tells you that, that you will become completely self-determined if you do exactly what you're told. You'll be thinking for yourself when you agree with Ron. John, this is a Hubbard device punishment on his own, cannibalizing his own devoted slaves who are locked in who have signed a billion year contract to serve him. And, and it's very, very probably the original technology of the Rehabilitation Project Force 
there's the brainwashing camps, the re-education camps in China. It seems that Hubbard probably, when he was in Queens, New York in 72, 73, read uh, Robert J. Lifton's book on the subject, Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism, and then applied the techniques, how you break people, how you get people to become obedient little puppy dogs or do everything they're told to do. Not really what was promised, is it, in the, in the original idea of Scientology? In later years, in the last 20 years, people are assigned to this prison camp would be in five years, seven years, 10 mm -hmm. years. And what is absolutely astounding is that Scientology management had absolute proof that it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Nobody who does the RPF, Mike Rinder did the RPF, I think for 18 months, whatever. Statistically, no one who does the RPF becomes, flips into being a, that it worked, that they become good. 70% mm -hmm. uh, of them route out within five years after seeing that darker side of the church, they are gone. Mm -hmm. And a huge percentage in the RPF are waiting to route out. They're saying, we're done, we're not staying on. They're waiting, but they're still incarcerated and can't escape till all kinds of procedures are done. John, did you know I was in the RPF for six months? Did you know yes, that? You, you have mentioned I had to run around a pole. Yeah, I had to run around a pole. Run around a pole. In those days, it was 12 hours a day. And that's how David Mayo um, lost all of his teeth. Yeah. Around yeah. a pole in the desert, poor David. We're not going to have time today to get into David Mayo, but we're going to do part two on Hubbard's personality and what he did to his nearest and dearest. So with Jenny, Janice, she was locked in this room and she said, I'm not going to do the RPF. So they put out a word that she had had a psychotic break. The whole campus was informed. She's crazy. No one is to speak to her because they had this introspection rundown, which was Hubbard's brilliant way to handle someone who had a meltdown yep. by complete silence, isolation, like they did till they killed Lisa McPherson. Yes. Complete isolation. So no one would speak to Jenny. Her food was hurled through a little slot three times a day. And there was absolute silence. After five to six days, the security guard Pug said, well, are you, are you, do you see that you need to do the RPF? Are you coming around? And Jenny just held her own. She had been right on top and she was not going to be kicked to the curb easily. She, she described Hubbard being like a father to her. She held affection, like she lived her life serving this, this man, tying his shoelaces, putting on his socks. I mean, just, and you see how he could just flip her cars. She was late, her car keys. He, she was told she was, in liability and spike is going to put what it means to be it's a you've done malicious work to harm mm. you have to be watched you can't be trusted you're a liability mm. now remember she was there since she was 11 years old and 12 years later she also is incarcerated with no one talking to her because the word is she's a crazy person having had a psychotic break. Mm -hmm. And this went on and on. <laughs> Jenny, <laughs> Jenny was not going to be subdued. Mm -hmm. But let's look at what Hubbard would do to one of his original messengers. She was a child. Mm -hmm. And Hubbard raised her. She never saw her, her parents. Yvonne was sent off to do missions to expand Scientology and create celebrity centers. Peter Gillum, her father, 
did was on the Apollo for a while. And did you know he was put in the chain locker? Did you know that? Peter no, Gillen? I haven't heard of that, Peter Senior as opposed to Peter Junior, yeah. But, so and, and maybe we ought to explain what the chain locker is. That, that on a ship you have an anchor chain, which is a great big heavy thing. And when you're at sea, the anchor is pulled up into the chain locker. And when you're docked, the anchor is, is set down so that the ship won't um, be pushed off course. So at that point, the chain locker is empty. Now, the chain locker on the Apollo was about four feet high. It, it wasn't standing height. It was completely black, completely dark. Um, Ken Urquhart criticised me for saying it was in the bowels of the ship. And um, Jerry Armstrong came back to him and said, well, where are your bowels? And it, it's not at the bottom of the ship, it's halfway up. Um, it's, there's bilge water in it, which is stinking, fetid water. There are rats in there, some of them a little bit sizable, you know. And so we we're going to tell the story of, of his, was it Doran Green? Derek. Derek Green. Derek. Four and a half year old. Yeah. He was put in this chain locker. This is child abuse. Four and a half year old yeah. was punished by being put in the chain locker. And it was Ron Hubbard who ordered that he be put in there. Absolutely. The so great Peter, humanitarian, the Buddha. There's no toilet in the chain locker. You saw your own pants. You urinate. Yeah. There's no, there's nothing to, nothing. And the chain locker punishment. We're, we're, we're giving an example of a four and a half year old kid ordered by Howard to be put in the chain locker. But I want to tell you that the chain locker punishment was a standard ongoing punishment. In fact, the messengers had the authority to chain locker someone even if Hubbard didn't order it. So teenage children could order adults to be put into the chain locker. So it's, mm -hmm. it's like Torquo Mardo, you know, let alone Caligula. So yeah. It's insane behavior. This, 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 is, <laughs> this is an aspect of Scientology cruelty, yeah. abject cruelty. Yeah. And Hubbard instigated this. Yes. Hubbard's issue called too gruesome. It covers punishments need to be made more gruesome. He enjoyed punishing, abusing, humiliating. This is why John finds these characteristics in the book and enlightens you on how easy it is to get seduced. Well, intelligent people, Mm. People with high academics can get sucked in and lured into this. That's why it's so vital to have videos like this. John, I'm really delighted that long after you and I have passed, this will be up on YouTube. <laughs> People have to know the yeah. mind of Howard. Yeah, and there's a the lot of material and and it, it's very difficult. There are so many people out there who are in what uh, Mr. Justice Leighty called the halfway house of the independents, who believe that Ron Hubbard, although quite evidently he was a liar, he contradicted himself. So, you know, he, his stories are not true. Um, he made up all sorts of tales of daring doe that he'd been, you know, the... Um, Alaskan radio experimental expedition, for example. They, Scientology has produced a book of the photographs that he took on this expedition. And curiously, all of the photographs are of Ketchikan, which is the port where he was stranded for six months. And that's what the expedition was. Um, so there's so much just nonsense spoken about him, which seeing what a devastatingly cruel and unpleasant human being he was there are still many people who want to hang on to this idea of salvation that Scientology will somehow give them superhuman powers well it's not true and it, it it's so important to let go of that and come back to reality you know and 
um, hopefully by talking about these things and you witnessed many of them, people can understand that Ron Hubbard is, he was very fond of the book Alice Through the Looking Glass. Many people are involved with Black Magic uh, like that book. It's, uh, I like it too, it's a brilliant book. But the thing that I realized about Scientology is, and indeed the piece of Blue Sky at one point was called Hubbard Through the Looking Glass. If you look in Russell Miller's Barefaced Messiah, one of the credits is to this book called Hubbard Through the Looking Glass. And that's to say, he's the opposite of what we wanted him to be. Bingo. Bingo. I knew you had some boogie woogie in your soul. Oh, I got boogie woogie in my soul. <laughs> <laughs> because you know how to exactly say it in just minimal sentences. Mm. Well done, John. Thank you. Love it. John when, uh, when I met Robert, Robert Vaughan Young for the first time, and I was the first, after four years after leaving, he called me up and he hadn't spoken to anybody but ex-sealed people. But when I met him for the first time, I actually pretty much exit counseled his wife, Stacy. But Vaughan was outside in the yard and every now and then he'd pop his, because he didn't want to lose the technology. He didn't, you know, he knew about Hubbard. He'd run the archive, you know, they knew that Hubbard was a fake and a fraud. But he poked his head in at one point and he looked at me and he, of course, had become a newspaper editor. And he said, John, you talk in pull quotes. You know, the, the little bit that's pushed out. And I, probably just from having spent now nearly 39 years since I left, and so what, 40, 48 years in total, talking about this subject, you, you do refine your stories. You know, you, you get down to hopefully shorter and simpler ways of saying things. Yes. But. Very. It's superbly done. Thank you. John, we haven't. We, now, I'm, now I feel on a roll on this. So can we continue on? I wanted to promote open minds. Give opening our minds. Opening your minds. I wanted to promote it a bit more. We cut into anecdotes a lot, but we need to really show them the value of this book. So let's continue. We haven't even touched David Mayo. Let's emphasize the book a lot more. I'm ready for the next show. When we come back, Zero in to open your minds. Zero into that. Okay. John, I love you. Love you too. Super to be with you always. Yeah. Take care, sweetheart. Bye bye. Thank you so much, Karen. Bye, everybody. Come on bye. back. We're back. Bye bye. Hi, John here. Thanks for watching. We'd appreciate it very much if you would click like as well as subscribe and click the bell for notifications. Every dollar helps and we welcome new patrons on Patreon. We can make a one-off payment with any currency through PayPal. Thanks so much.